Good morning, and welcome to worship in First Coleraine. It's lovely to see you this morning as we gather together to declare God is God and he rules over all. Let us worship God together. Our call to worship is this beautiful verse from Revelation chapter 5 and verse 12. It's a responsive call. What a wonderful way to begin the week by asking this question of, uh, of ourselves. Worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. Is he worthy? He is. Let's stand and sing together beneath the cross of Jesus. And let's confess our sins together and receive of his grace. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for how your word contradicts everything we assume about the way life is supposed to work. We expect to get what's coming to us. We demand fairness, an honest return for our labor, time and talent. But we thank you that the gospel flies in the face of convention and all that we assume is normal. And for that, we are eternally grateful. Thank you for not being fair with us. Thank you for being outrageously generous, immeasurably kind, and scandalously good. What we could never earn your perfect righteousness you've given to us as a gift. What we fully deserve to be dealt with according to the wages of our sin, you do not do. What we cannot imagine, that you would justify ungodly people like us, you have joyfully and legally done 
though our sins be as scarlet this week, we turn to you for forgiveness and cleansing, for you can wash them white as snow. Because of Jesus, because of his one and once and for all finished work, our transgressions are forgiven. Every single one of them. Our sins are covered. Every single one of them. And you'll never hold us guilty for any of our trespasses. Not any one of them. Truly we have received grace upon grace, Father. Thank you for reconciling us to yourself through Jesus and for placing us in your now and forever kingdom. Thank you for not just welcoming us, but for wanting us. Though we are glad that you have promised us heaven one day, we are thrilled that you already delight in us this day. By the power of the Holy Spirit, drive this gospel, this wonderful gospel, deeper and deeper into our hearts. For it is the only gospel that will set us free to live and to love for your glory. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Let's stand and adore him for his love towards us. Let's sing together, love divine, all love excel. Folks, let's turn to God's Word, uh, and we'll read it uh, together. You should have a pew Bible this morning. 
which is another step on the journey forward. So uh, if you have your own Bible, that's fine. If you turn with me to Acts chapter 18, and we're going to read together from verse 23 through to chapter 19 and verse 7. And Katie May is going to come and read this for us. Katie. After spending some time in Antioch, Paul set out there and travelled from place to place throughout the region of Galatia and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and he spoke with great passion and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew only he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him to their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. When Apollos wanted to go to Anchia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote, wrote to the disciples there to welcome him. On arriving, he was great help to those who by grace had believed, for he vigorously refuted the Jews in the public debate proving from the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. Kitty May, thank you so much for that beautiful reading. Boys and girls, if you would like to come down to the front, I am going to come down to talk to you. If you find a wee space, on the floor down at the front. That would be great. Thank you. Five little ducks, really. <laughs> this has taken a life of its own, hasn't it, really? Brilliant, brilliant. <laughs> well, if you're visiting with us or if you're watching online, uh, we sometimes in our church go to a little place called Duckville. Duckville. Very special place, just like Corain, but a place where all the inhabitants are. Ducks. Well, you've been on half term this week, haven't you? You had a holiday this week. You see, they were all back at school this week in Duckville with Mrs. Jemima Puddle Duck and the class. Only on Monday they had a very special visitor. I don't know if you ever have a special visitor in school. Do you have special visitors who come into school? And this day, last Monday, they had a very special visitor called the Reverend Mallard. Thank you to the Sparrows for the Reverend Mallard. Uh, a wonderful little gift. Um, the Reverend Mallard came to visit the boys and girls. Is a wee problem standing up. But um, he came to, and he was going to teach the boys and girls a new song that they were going to sing in church that Sunday called Be Bold, Be Strong. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Peter. Super duper. Can, can I take that off? Is that, is that okay? You're not? Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Thank you. Oh. I'm all plugged in as well. Good. He's going to teach them a new song called Be Bold, Be Strong. So he got them all up. They're all standing. And they're all about to sing. Be bold, be strong. But the Reverend Mallard noticed one of the wee ducks wasn't singing. If he was singing, he wasn't singing very loudly. Can you figure out what duck it might have been who maybe wasn't singing? Donald. We Donald again. Donald was standing out to the side and Donald, he just didn't 
he wasn't singing very, very much at all. And, and so their mother dropped all the ducks and he said, right, well, we'll start again, we'll try it, try again. Just in case you didn't know this, there's a great, great song called Bebo, Be Strong. Bebo, Be Strong. Oh, you know this? No, uh, no. Something wrong with Don, Donald. Donald's not, not singing like Donald should be singing. So he, he stopped and he said, Donald, tell me this. You're, you're not singing, singing out. Why, why is that? Well, Donald said, it's like this, your reverence, he said, um, I'm not a very good singer. And, and my voice is a wee bit higher than all the other ducks. And when I sing out loud, sometimes all the other ducks, they laugh at me because my voice is quite loud. Quite loud, it's a wee bit squeaky. Well, said the Reverend Malik, he says, do you see what I'm holding in my hand? Eh? guitar he said it's a very interesting instrument the guitar because it's it makes it makes beautiful sounds listen oh lovely is that really isn't that beautiful really lovely isn't it he said but hmm? i i heard you were learning the guitar jensen mission impossible great maybe after church we'll have a wee go at that and see okay brilliant he said, the Reverend Mallard said, Donald, I want you to look. He said, do you see these things on the guitar? Do you know what those are called? Strings, strings he said. But he said, see, not all the strings are the same. You've got, you've got E's and A strings and G strings and B strings and E strings. And they're all different. He said, there's some that sing. Oh, oh I think I'm pulling, pulling out again. Um, <laughs> Some that sing very, very low. It's a very low string, isn't it? Can you sing that low? Low, 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 low. And they're big, big, big round strings. And, and they're usually quite loose. They just hang. He said, and then there's a, there's a higher string. It's a G string. And G, G sounds like this. Can you do that? La. What, which, is, which is higher, the E or the G? G is, is, is a much tougher. And he says, but there's, there's one string, and it's another E string, and it's even higher than that. It's the highest string. Listen, listen, cover this. Wow! He said, wow, it's really high. <clears throat> He said, but do you know what? He said, in my guitar, you need the low strings. You need the middle strings. And you need the high strings. I mean, what would be bold, be strong sound like on just the bass? Be bold, be strong. Oh, the Lord your God is with you. Be bold, be strong. That would sound pretty boring, wouldn't it? He said, no, 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 no. He said, you need, you need the low ones and you need the high ones and you need all the ones in between on the guitar to make the right noise together. What a wonderful thing it is, he says it is, when all of the strings play together. Be bold, be strong, for the Lord your God is with you. Oh, what a great sound, he said, that was, isn't it? Well, you know, that gave, that gave Donald great heart and he moved right into the middle of the choir and whenever the Reverend Mallard started up again, well, do you think Donald sang? He really did sing. He really did sing. Look at the con look at look at them. Look at, can you see them all? Stand up and look at them. Stand up, stand up, we sing, look at them. Okay. Some of them are tall. Some of them are small. Some of them are big and round. Some of them are tall and, uh, tall and taut. Okay? Every single one of us is part of a wonderful, wonderful thing. God has brought us together to sing his praise and to declare his worth together. Do you know what we're going to sing? What are we going to sing? What do you think we're going to sing together?
Be bold, be strong. Let's stand and sing together. Oh, and on the way out, make sure you pick up a little sweetie from the table on the way out to adventures. Okay, let's do that. And let us turn to God's word and we'll turn to Acts 18 and 19 as we continue our little journey in the unfinished story. And as we turn to study God's word together, let's pray and ask for God's help. Father, this is your word and it is a living word. And we pray that you would speak to us, challenge us, encourage us, comfort us, even rebuke us but lead us to Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So a guy went to the doctors one day, and the doctor said, well, what, what can I do for you? And he said, well, doc, it's, a, it's a, a bit weird, but I've discovered that I can suddenly tell the future. Wow, said the doctor. When did that start? He said, next Wednesday. Well, last Wednesday, uh, we went through this passage, chapter 18 and the whole of chapter 19, uh, together, verse by verse. And I don't intend to do that this morning, because on Thursday, I had an epiphany. I had an epiphany. And I, I, I have been really perplexed about uh, this little section of Acts and how it fits in to the whole story that we've been journeying through. Um, and on Thursday, something came to me. It, it struck me as I read through the passages again. So I apologize for this morning. This, this might be a little bit boring. This is you, what's new? <laughs> this might be a little bit boring for you this morning. And I apologize if that is so. But let me take you on a journey. I've been thinking about how this little section, and, and you can see that the Holy Spirit comes upon 12 uh, men in Ephesus. And I've been wondering about where this actually fits. As you know, as you, if you've been journeying with us, that there are four Pentecosts, four Pentecostal events in the book of Acts. If you've been with us, you've seen how the Holy Spirit seems to be given at four specific times. And over the past days, I've read commentaries, listened to sermons, and, and thought through all of the possibilities. But there are some things that I have noticed about this this week that have just struck me. Now, please believe me, I am no great theologian, nor do I think that I've been given some new radical insight. But let me share these things, and if you agree or disagree, or if, you, if these things trouble you, then let's talk about them this Wednesday night. Have a look at Acts chapter 18 and the verses that we started in verse uh, 23. We find there uh, that we're introduced to a new figure in the story. Someone new appears on the scene. A man named Apollos. Apollos. And the thing that bothers me is why 
Luke, you remember Luke is the one who's writing Acts. I wonder why Luke includes Apollos just here. You know that he's writing on manuscript. Ink is scarce, parchment is scarce. Every word counts. He has taken great lengths to structure this uh, in, in such a way that it tells a story. And the question is, why do we hear about Apollos now? And how do these next bits of Apollos, then Paul in Ephesus, the giving of the Holy Spirit, the casting out of demons, the miracles that Paul does, how does this all fit together? Well, we're told in verse 24, and we're given a very important description of Apollos. In just a few short words, Luke tells us a great deal about him. He is a Jew, yet his name is Apollos. He's a native of Alexandria, but he's come to Ephesus. Now, that's incredible. That's an incredible amount of information in such a short little space of words. He is a Jew. There was a huge Jewish community in Alexandria. Alexandria was one of the top cities in the world at the time. It had a huge, huge library. It was a place of great learning, much more important than Athens at this time. So he's obviously been taught well. He's, he's a Jew, but his name is Apollos. That's a Greek name. It's not a Jewish name. That's a Greek name. So he is both Jewish but he's probably from a Gentile background. Interesting. Keep that in your mind. And he's a native of Alexander who has come to Ephesus. Why is he in Ephesus at this moment? Well, it's clear from what Luke tells us that he had been set on fire by the ministry of John the Baptist. And he'd become an evangelist. He'd been proclaiming the, the John the Baptist's message of repentance. And he arrived in Ephesus at the end of Acts chapter 18, preaching this great message of repentance, and he preaches it with power. Paul had just left town. Apollos arrived just after Paul had departed, and they had missed each other, but he got to know Aquila and Priscilla. Now, it's clear from what Luke tells us that Apollos didn't know the full gospel of Jesus. He was familiar with all that John the Baptist had taught. John the Baptist had called people to repentance, to hasten the day of the Messiah coming. It was a, it was a really amazing message. Up until that point, up until the time of John the Baptist, people had gone to the temple to sacrifice lambs and goats and, and doves uh, as a sacrifice for their sins. But here was John coming and telling them something different. Instead of going and making sacrifice, now you could turn to God in repentance. You didn't have to go and make the sacrifice. This was something really new, and it caught like wildfire across the Jewish community right across the world. He had, uh, Apollos had obviously heard this message, and it had caught his heart too. But he hadn't heard the rest of the story. It was obviously he knew something of Jesus, but it was clear he hadn't really understood if he knew what Jesus' de life, death, and resurrection actually meant. So we're told that Aquila and Priscilla took him into their home, and over their kitchen table they explained the way of God more perfectly to him. And it was as if somebody had poured petrol on the fire. And what was once a burning desire became a roaring flame in Apollos' life. And he became a powerful follower of Christ and a preacher of the gospel of Jesus. And his desire to spread that was so great that he wanted to go to Corinth and, uh, and speak the word of the Lord. So the, the church sent him there and he left for Ephesus to go to Corinth. And that brings us to the end of chapter 18. Now Luke continues this John the Baptist theme. Did you notice that as we entered Acts chapter 19? There's a, a similar situation. While Apollos was traveling over the Aegean Sea from Ephesus to Corinth, Paul is traveling overland through Asia Minor and coming to Ephesus, this great trading city. 
And there he found, we're told, some John the Baptist disciples. If you ever get the opportunity to visit Ephesus, I have never done so. I'm told that you can actually walk down some of the streets that Paul walked. They're ruins now, but you can stand in the stadium where the riot occurred that we're going to come to shortly in this chapter. And you can walk into the remains of the houses where early Christians would have met. Christianity caught fire in Ephesus. This became the focus of Paul's ministry for quite a period of time. It, in fact, perhaps some people say it's, it's Paul's greatest success story, the city of Ephesus. Have a look at chapter, one, or chapter 19 and verse 1. While Apollos was at Corinth, Paul took the road through the interior and arrived at Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no. We've not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. There were about 12 men in all. The ministry of John the Baptist was sensational. The Jews had not seen a, a fire and brimstone prophet for centuries, and suddenly John had shown up like Elijah in the wilderness. And he'd called people to repentance and to faith. And that had spread right across the, the empire. And obviously these, these men had been influenced by it. So when Paul came to Ephesus and visited the Jewish community, he found this small John the Baptist group there. They had taken John's message seriously. And had been baptized with the baptism of repentance. They longed to get their lives right before God. To hasten the coming of the Messiah. But they didn't know that the Messiah had come already. Paul said in verse 4, do you see, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, and that is in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of Jesus. But look at verse 6, and this is where I want us to focus this morning. When Paul placed his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Now this is, this is the part that I have found perplexing. As I said, there are four Pentecostal events in the book of Acts. Three of them we've already come across. And they all involved Peter. But this one, this one's different. This one involves Paul. Why is that? Why is that? Well, let's, let's review them just in case you've forgotten them or you're visiting with us and, and you, you haven't done the journey with us. Let's, let's go over briefly the four Pentecostal events. The first is the one that you and I already know about in Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit came upon the 120 Jewish believers in the upper room and that launched the church at the very beginning in Jerusalem. Uh, it's the one that we celebrate as Pentecost, the coming of the Holy Spirit, Acts chapter 2. The second, do you remember, we found in Acts chapter 8. It's called the Samaritan Pentecosts. Acts chapter 8 and 14 says, When the whole apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had accepted the word of God, they sent Peter and John to Samaria. When they arrived, they prayed for the new believers that they might receive the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit had not yet come on any of them. And they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John placed their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. That was the Samaritan Pentecost. The third Pentecost, if you remember, came in Acts chapter 10 with Cornelius 
and the Gentiles. Acts chapter 10 and verse 44 says, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. The Gentile Pentecost. But now, here in Acts 19, we find something similar but different. When Paul placed his hands on these Ephesians, the Holy Spirit came on them and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. So what's this all about? What's going on? Well, you and I can understand the first three Pentecostal events to the Jews, to the Samaritans, and to the Gentiles. That seems like a logical, almost domino effect as the church begins to spread and to grow. But what's going on here in Acts chapter 19 to the disciples of John in Ephesus? Well, if you want to fall asleep, let me tell you very briefly. Let me suggest that the first two Pentecostal events in Jerusalem and Samaria represented the Hebrew Pentecost or the Israelite Pentecost. Representatives of all 12 tribes were swept into the church. The episode with Cornelius represented the Gentiles being swept into the church. But here in Ephesus, this final Pentecost represents Jew and Gentile being united in a glorious unity into one almost cosmopolitan church. Now you can fall asleep if you want to. Let me explain. Everyone in Acts 2 who was baptized in the Spirit was Jewish. It occurred in Jerusalem, the capital of Judah, Judah, that the people who had come to worship in Jerusalem for that festival, all of those who had come were Jewish from right around the world to celebrate the festival of Pentecost. The day of Pentecost was of the Jews. It was a baptism of the Jews. And when it came to the Samaritans, have you you ever noticed how concerned Jesus was for Samaria? He seemed to be particularly burdened for that patch of land between Judah and Galilee. It was a piece of land despised by the Jews of Judah. In Luke 17, we're told that Jesus traveled along the border of Samaria and Galilee. In John chapter 4, he cut through the mountains right into the heart of Samaria. In Luke chapter 9, he diverted to, into Samaria a final time as he was on his way to Jerusalem for the crucifixion. In Luke chapter 10, he told the story of the good Samaritan. And uh, in the Great Commission at the end, he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and in Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Why this burden for Samaria? Well, of course, Jesus had a burden for everyone. But there, I think there are at least two reasons why I think Samaria was special in Jesus' mind. Firstly, it was part of the Holy Land, the Holy Ground. When, when God gave Canaan to Israel at the conquest of Joshua, it included both south and north, from the Negev Desert in the south right to the northern border with Lebanon. And more importantly, secondly, Jesus knew the Samaritans were the survivors of the lost ten tribes of Israel. Now, I don't have time to go into the whole history of Israel, but you and I know that uh, after Solomon's death, uh, Israel was split into two kingdoms, north and south, the ten tribes in the north and the two tribes, Judah and Benjamin in the south. First of all, the Assyrians came because of the rebellious uh, ten tribes in the north and carried them off, most of them off into uh, captivity, but settled a lot of other peoples into the northern tribes and the tribes mixed and they became known as Samaritans. It's a very difficult and long history. But there were still survivors and stragglers who remained in the land. There are still some Samaritans in the Holy Land today, actually descendants of these people. This was, it would explain why Jesus was so preoccupied with the Samaritans. First, where they lived was a land that belonged to God. 
And secondly, they were remnants of the so-called lost ten tribes. They were non-Jewish Israelites, if you like. Children of Israel from tribes other than Judah. So the Pentecostal event in Jerusalem brought the southern Jews, the southern Hebrews into the church. And the Samaritan Pentecost event brought the northern Hebrews into the church. It represented two sides, if you like, of the same coin. The Pentecostal event in Acts chapter 10 involved the family of Cornelius and it was clearly a Gentile Pentecost. It merged the Gentiles into the church along with the Israelites. So we have one church, but it's made up of two seg segments, if you like, the Jews and the Gentiles. But the whole concept of the church in Ephesus is the merging of the two. The amalgamating of these two sides into one so that they are no longer two, but one. At Ephesus, the Holy Spirit descended to mark the birth of the church that you and I now belong to. A unified church of both Jew and Gentile. Now, why do I say all of that? Well, I say all of that because what struck me this week is what the Apostle Paul, who was there for this, uh, this Pentecost in Ephesus, in Ephesus, here's what Paul writes in his letter to the Ephesians. Listen very carefully. In Ephesians, what we call Ephesians chapter 2, Paul writes this. Therefore, Remember that formerly you were Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands. Remember that at one time you were separate from Christ, excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise, without hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility by setting aside in his flesh the law with its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. He came and preached peace to you who were far away and peace to those who were near. For through him, we both have access to the Father by one Spirit. Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and strangers, but fellow citizens with God's people and also members of his household built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And in him, you too are being built together into, uh, to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. You too, T-W-O, you too are being built together. Do you see? This first Pentecostal event was for the Jews in Jerusalem. The second was for the Samaritans, the remaining Israelites from the lost ten tribes. The third for the Gentiles, but the fourth. The fourth is the coming together of it all, where it all comes together. Dare I say it, almost the birth of the church, composed of Jews and Gentiles in full unity of Christ. I find it amazing how Luke puts all of this together. This is the thing that struck me. Maybe this afternoon you want to open this and, 
And you'll see how Luke writes this, almost paralleling the ministry of Jesus. He begins with the ministry of John the Baptist. He begins with 12 men, Acts chapter 19 and verse 7. His ministry in Ephesus lasts three years, Acts chapter 20 and verse 31. It involves the proclamation of the gospel, accompanied with miracles and overcoming demonic forces, just like Jesus. And at the end of three years, the preacher leaves his flock and the church continues to grow. The parallel with the ministry of Jesus is unmistakable. This, I think, is the unfolding of the, of the church as it is today, the rolling out of the church in Acts into the world. The moment that we become part of the body, shareholders and partakers in the body and the blood and the baptism of Christ. Oh, sorry, is it, right. oh great, James. Wonderful. Wonderful, I've, I've slept through most of that. So what has this got to do with me sitting here in cool rain today? Might well you ask. Well, the implications of this, I think, are absolutely huge for us. Huge for us. If this is true, this is the answer to all of the huge questions that our culture is asking today. Where are the battlegrounds in our culture? Racism, misogyny, class? Where are people fighting today? Where are the big disagreements? We've all been baptized together into one family. Listen to what Paul says. In Christ, there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus, heirs according to the promise. If this is true, this is the true biblical answer to the powerlessness of our day. We have been baptized into the unstoppable plan and purpose of Jesus to build his church. Listen to what Jesus says, I will build this. I will build you. I will build my church. And the gates of hell will not stand against it. We are part of the unstoppable building of the church. Be bold. Be strong. For the Lord your God is with you. If this is true, this is the biblical answer to our futures, to yours and mine. The cross is behind us. Heaven is in front of us. And the Holy Spirit is within us. And we have nothing to fear. Nothing. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this powerful word to us today. Thank you for this wonderful gift of the Holy Spirit that drew both Jew and Gentile into the church. Thank you, Lord, that because of this day, we are heirs of the promise, children of Abraham. We have a hope and a future. We have a life now of power and a life that is yet to be. The cross is behind us. Heaven is before us. The Holy Spirit is within us. Thank you for your wonderful promise to us. Help us to go, O oh Lord, and to live as those who know this to be true. We pray for our world at this time, Lord, torn apart by disagreement and hurt and violence and misunderstanding and confusion and hypocrisy. Thank you, Lord, that your word cuts through it all. Lord, fear fills our newspapers and our news broadcasts, rumors of wars and wars all about us, conflicts and party political interest. Father, our hearts would be broken today 
and filled with fear, except that we know this truth to be true, that Jesus is building his church and he will do it. Father, thank you for calling us to be brothers and sisters in Christ. Help us to go and to live as such. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Let's join to sing again together. Lord, speak to me that I may speak. And may the grace of the Lord Christ Jesus and the love of the Father above and the presence and the power of the Spirit of God go with us this day and forevermore. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.